Indian philosophies and yoga. Here I give you the basic principles involved in Indian philosophies and where they come from. I give you the aerial view which will give you bigger picture than each individual book. What are these words Samkhya and Vedanta? There are two different school of thoughts in which Indian philosophy rests. First, Bhagavad Gita. Most people call this Hindu Bible. I researched elaborately and found that this is founded on Samkhya and that the meaning of nearly all the technical words in it are practically limited by the meaning in philosophy Samkhya. I'll explain Samkhya philosophy later. There are certain phrases in Bhagavad Gita which belong to the Vedanta, but the great majority are Samkhya, and it's taken for granted that the people reading or using the book are familiar with the outline of the Samkhya philosophy. In depth details are not needed, but I give you the leading ideas of this philosophy. If you understand these, and if you ever happen to read this Bhagavad Gita, you will do so from some kin angle and you will be able to use it practically for yogic purposes in that way. Like Bhagavad Gita, there is one more set of books, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Both the terms are Samkhyan. Historically, Yoga is based on the Samkhya, so far as its philosophy is concerned. Now, about Samkhya. Samkhya does not concern itself with the existence of deity contrary to the uh, Western belief. Uh, we, we, I mean, in Western uh, people think India is full of deities, gods and goddesses. But in the philosophy it's not that. But only with the becoming of a, it's concerned with the becoming of the universe, the order of evolution. Hence it's often called Nereshwara Samkhya, the Samkhya without God. But so closely it's found up with the yoga system, the latter is called Seswara Samkhya with God. For its understanding, therefore, I must outline part of the Samkhya philosophy, that part which deals with the real relation of spirit and matter. Now I introduce the difference from this Samkhya to the other school of thought. The second one is Vetan, the conception of self and not self and then find the reconciliation in another modern school, the theosophic statement of the fact in nature, the directions which fall from the lips of the Lord of Yoga, that's Krishna, you have heard about Krishna consciousness. This Krishna, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, his words may sometimes seem to us opposed to each other and contradictory in Bhagavad Gita because they sometimes are phrased in the Samkhyan and sometimes in the Vedantic terms, starting from different standpoints. One looking at the world from the standpoint of matter, the other from the standpoint of spirit. In the modern school of philosophy, mostly for interpretation purposes, the knowledge of the facts will enable you to translate the different phrases. That reconciliation and understanding of these apparently contradictory phrases is the object to which I would ask your attention now. The Samkin school starts with the statement that the universe consists of two factors, the first pair of opposites, spirit and matter, or more accurately spirits and matter. The spirit is called Purusha, the man, and each spirit is an individual. Purusha is a unit, a unit of consciousness. They are all of the same nature but distinct everlastingly the one from the other. Of these units, there are many countless Purushas are to be found in the world of men. But while they are countless in number, they are identical in nature. They are homogeneous. Every Purusha has three characteristics and these three are alike in all. One characteristic is awareness, it will become cognition. The second of the characteristics is life or prana, it will become activity. The third characteristic is immutability, the essence of eternity. It will become will. Eternity is not, as some mistakenly think, everlasting time. Everlasting time has nothing to do with eternity. Time and eternity are two altogether different things. Eternity is changeless, immutable, simultaneous. No succession in time, albeit everlasting. Such could be, could give eternity. The fact that Purusha has this attribute of immutability tells us that he is eternal, for changelessness is a mark of the eternal. Such are the three attributes of Purusha according to the Samkhya. Though these are not the same in nomenclature as the Vedantic, Satchit, Ananda, yet they are practically identical. Awareness or cognition is chit. Life or force is sat. 
and immutability. The essence of eternity is Ananda. Over against this Purusha's homogeneous units, countless in number, stands Prakriti, matter, the second in the Samkhya duality. Prakriti is one, Purushas are many. Prakriti is a continuum, Purushas are discontinuous, being innumerable, homogeneous units. Continuity is a mark of Prakriti. Pass for a moment on the name Prakriti. Let's investigate its root meaning. The name indicates its essence. Pra means forth and Kri is the root make. Prakriti thus means forth making. Matter is that while enables the essence of being to become. That which is being is tense, becomes existence, out being by matter and to describe matter as forth making is to give its essence in a single word only by prakriti can spirit or purusha forth make or manifest himself without the presence of prakriti purusha is helpless a mere abstraction only by the presence of and in prakriti can purusha make manifest his powers prakriti has also three characteristics the well-known gunas or attributes or qualities. These are rhythm, mobility, and inertia. I repeat the three gunas. These are rhythm, mobility, and inertia. Rhythm enables awareness to become cognition. Mobility enables life to become activity. Inertia enables immutability to become will. Now the conception as to the relation of spirit to matter is a very peculiar one and confused ideas about it give rise to many misconceptions. If you grasp it, the Bhagavad Gita becomes illuminated and all the phrases about action and actor and the mistake of saying I act become easy to understand as implying technical samkhin ideas. The three qualities of Prakriti. The Prakriti is thought of as away from Purusha, are in equilibrium motionless, poised the one against the other, counterbalancing and neutralizing each other so that matter is called jada, unconscious or dead. But in the presence of purusha, all is changed. When purusha is in proper inquity matter, then there is a change in matter, not outside but in it. Purusha acts on prakriti by propinquity, says Vyasa, the ancient sign of Indian philosophy. It comes near Prakriti and Prakriti begins to live. The coming near is a figure of speech, an adaptation to our ideas of time and space, for we cannot posit nearness of that which is timeless and spaceless, that is spirit. By the word Propinquity is indicated an influence exerted by Purusha or Prakriti, and this where material objects are concerned would be brought about by that propinquity.